This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello and welcome to WLC Radio. Now, have we got an interesting topic for you today? Oh, by the way, I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright, and thanks for tuning in. Now, as you can probably tell, we're quite excited about this. Now, have you heard of the twins that were born in different years, Dave? Hang on. Hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. It may be a bit early for you for this sort of thing. Is this some kind of joke? No, 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 no. No, it's true. It's true. Sawyer Shea was born in Glendale, Arizona, in the United States on December 31st, 2016 at 11.50 p.m. His brother, Everett, you see where this is going. His brother, Everett, (laughs) was born the next year, 2017, at 12.01 a.m. on January the 1st. (laughs) There you go. I suppose this is going to be quite fun to explain in the years ahead, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of fun for Sawyer, really. He can claim to be a year older than his brother. Not so fun for Everett. Now, the thing is, it's totally arbitrary, yeah? The, who decided a day should start in the middle of the night? If you've joined us before, you'll know that we prefer to use the personal name of the creator, which is Yahweh or Yah. The son's name is Yahushua, which of course means Yahweh saves. Eloah is a Hebrew title of respect and refers to Yahweh. You know your story of the Shea twins, born on mm. different days, in different yeah. months, in different years. Mm. It's really fun that to laugh about that, of course. Well, yeah, of course. It'll certainly be a great conversation starter when they get older. Yes. Of course it will, yes, but (laughs) you're right, it is completely arbitrary. And the Shea twins can claim to be born on different days simply because on the calendar we now use, days start at midnight. Now, where does that come from? Who decided a day actually starts in the middle of the night? Well, I don't actually have a name, but different cultures have started their days at different times. The ancient Egyptians, now they started their day at sunrise. Which makes sense, they were sun worshippers. Both Babylon and Greece started their days at sunset. That's, which is weird, it just, you know, it, it, it's counterintuitive, isn't it, to start a day at sunset. Days on our modern calendar start at midnight because that's what the Romans did. Most people know that the Jews today start their Sabbaths when the sun sets on Friday evening. Mm. And right, they keep their Sabbath from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. And unfortunately, most Protestants who worship on Saturday also start their Sabbath observance at sunset for no other reason than it. That's, that's when, when the, the Jews, Jews do, it. do it. Yes. <laughs> what most people don't know, though, is that the Jewish practice of starting the day at sunset actually began when the Jews were in apostasy. How ironic! One of the main practices that sets the Jews apart as different... And which are copied by non-Jews wanting to worship on the seventh-day Sabbath. Yeah, and it isn't even a legit Israelite practice. It's not. They adopted it from paganism. Some Mm -hmm. pagans started at noon, others at sunrise, still others at sunset, and again the Romans started at midnight. Yeah, so, so back before the Israelites apostatized, for example, during the time of Moses, when did the Israelites start their day? At dawn. No, at at dawn? Seriously? Seriously, that's when the day starts in Scripture. Why don't you just grab your Bible? Let's have a look at some evidence here. And for our listener, this is more than just an unimportant bit of trivia. Everything Satan has warped, everything he's changed and hidden, has always been for a purpose. But when you pull together the weight of evidence spread throughout Scripture, a day begins at dawn and ends at dusk. 
Mm. You're saying dawn then? Do you mean sunrise? No, no, no. Dawn. Now let's take a moment here to define our terms. Mm. Just read Jeremiah chapter 31 and it's verse 35 for us, please. Yeah, just give me a sec. Just one sec. 35. Thus saith Yahuwah, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. Yahuwah of hosts is his name. The sun was given to rule the day, the moon and the stars to rule the night. In other words, a day begins prior to sunrise. It begins with the gentle dawning of light when the stars disappear. A night begins with the coming of darkness, when the stars begin to appear. So this is after sunset. You know, this actually makes more sense than a day beginning at sunset. That's always struck me as so counterintuitive. Why would you start a day when the night begins? <laughs> yeah. but, but now, what about a calendar date? You know, when the day starts at dawn, how do you figure the date out? The same way you do on the Gregorian calendar. You recognise that a calendar date is not synonymous with a day. Right. A calendar date includes both the day and the night. It's just that on the biblical calendar, the date begins at dawn. Right. A day is only the first half of the calendar date, while the night is the second half. Actually, that makes more sense than the arbitrarily spitting the night in in half and, and saying that half the night belongs to one date and then half the night belongs to the other date. The creator's calendar makes so much more sense. It's an incredibly elegant, very accurate method of timekeeping. But yeah, Satan has got us off on when a day begins too. But when you look at the evidence in scripture, you're going to come to a profound conclusion. Day and night are totally opposite of each other and are two distinctly different periods, never occupying the same space of time. But let's go back and start at the very beginning with creation week. Would you just turn there to Genesis chapter 1 and read the first five verses for us? Okay. If we had no other scripture to prove when the day began, this alone would prove the day starts with the coming of light at dawn. In the beginning Elohim created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohah moved upon the face of the waters, and Elohim said, Let there be light, and there was light. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good, and Elohim divided the light from the darkness, and Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first thing created was light. What was there before the light? Well, it was just dark. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. To claim that the day actually starts in the evening, it's ridiculous. Mm. Just think about it for a moment. Everything is dark, and Elohim says, let there be light. Then what happened? There was light. <laughs> yeah. But if the day began at night time, was the first day of creation only 12 hours long? Or did Elohim say, let there be light, and then explain, this is day one starting now, just be patient and in 12 hours we'll actually get ourselves some light? Or did Elohim say, let there be light, and then retroactively declare that the previous 12 hours had actually been part of the day? I see what you're saying. just doesn't make sense, does it? No, it really doesn't. Just read verse 5 again for us. Okay. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. See, they're even naming it here. They called the right. light day, and the day, darkness yeah. they called night. Yeah, you see, that, that makes a lot more sense. But then how do you explain the last f phrase? Okay, so it says, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Now, wouldn't that suggest that it starts at night? Right after they named the light day? No. What it's explaining here is what constitutes a complete 24-hour period or a complete date. You start with the light, that's the day. You go through the day and finally come to the dark, that's the night. Then you circle back around to the next morning and you've got a complete 24-hour period. This is how calendar dates are determined in Scripture. Right, I see. So the night carries the date of the day that precedes it, yes, yeah? Yes, exactly, yes. And you'll find that in Scripture. Right. When okay. the night hours are given a date, the night carries the date of the day that preceded it. Can you give us an example? Yes, of course. All right, let's take a look at Passover. 
Now, the traditional understanding based on our modern calendar is that Passover occurred on a Thursday night and the Israelites left Egypt on a Friday morning. Now, this goes along with the assumptions made about the crucifixion. People have assumed that the Last Supper occurred on a Thursday evening with Christ being crucified the next morning. Yeah, but we know that this is impossible because the lunisolar calendar of Scripture does not have a continuous weekly cycle. You know, the weekly cycle restarts every month. There is no Thursday and Friday of the biblical calendar. Right. But actually, it's more than that. This understanding has been based on the fact that Jews today start their Sabbath observance Friday evening at sunset. So people have extrapolated from that to assume Passover was Thursday night. But let's see what the Bible says. Turn to Exodus chapter 12, Mm -hmm. and this is where Yah gave Moses instructions on how to observe the Passover. They were to take a lamb, kill it, and paint its blood on the lintel and the doorposts as a sign to the destroying angel. Then they were to eat the Passover meal. But Moses gave them very special instructions that in our assumptions we tend to overlook. Mm -hmm. So just read verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 12, would you please, Miles? Yep. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. Okay. They were not to go out of their houses until morning. Now, this is a huge piece of the puzzle, showing the Israelites understood the day to start at dawn and the night carried the date of the day that preceded it. So now just turn on a little bit to Numbers chapter 33 and uh, just read verse 3 from that chapter, please. And they departed from Ramesses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. This verse gives an actual calendar date. They left Egypt on the 15th of Abib, the first month. Both Exodus 12 and Leviticus 23 give us the date of Passover, and that's Abib 14. So the Israelites left on the 15th. Now, Last verse. Read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1. Now, remember, Passover was eaten on the 14th. They were not to leave their homes until morning, and they left on the 15th of the month. So what does Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1 say? Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto Yahuwah thy Eloah. For in the month of Abib, Yahuwah thy Eloah brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. By night. Night, The yes. Israelites left Egypt at night. Now, what is confusing to a lot of people is that Passover was indeed the day before the seventh day Sabbath. Yahushua was crucified on the sixth day of the week, the day before the Sabbath. He was the Lamb of Yah that taketh away the sins of the world. So he was crucified on the Passover, the sixth day of the week. And what is important for our listener to understand is that on the biblical lunisolar calendar, the 14th of every month always falls on the sixth day of the week, and the 15th is always a seventh day Sabbath. Yeah, because the weekly cycle restarts every month. So let's put the evidence together here. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 1 states the Israelites left Egypt at night. Now, we know this could not have been Passover night, as many have assumed, because Exodus 12 verse 22 says that no one is to leave their homes until the morning. This is confirmed by Numbers 33 verse 3, which gives the actual date they left Egypt, the 15th day of the first month. So you're saying the day of Passover, which we know was always on the 14th and always the sixth day of the week, began at dawn and did not end until the dawn of the next day, the 15th? Correct. But even when it was dawn and and they could leave their houses, they still didn't go. Why, Why didn't they finally leave? You're saying that they hung around until that night. Yes. Remember, on the lunisolar calendar, the 15th is always a Sabbath. Yah would not break his own Sabbaths by having them leave Egypt during the sacred hours of the day. That is why he led them out when the sacred hours of the Sabbath were over that night. 
Okay, I, I can see that, but it just raises even more questions. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break, and then we've got some more questions for you. Sure. Most people today believe that Saturday is the seventh day Sabbath of Scripture for no other reason than it is the day on which the Jews worship. The problem is, this proves nothing. Saying, the Jews worship on Saturday, therefore Saturday is the Sabbath because that is when the Jews worship, is an excellent example of circular reasoning. The astonishing truth is that Jewish scholars themselves acknowledge that Saturday is not the original ancient Sabbath of Scripture. If you would like to learn more, go to our website, worldslastchance.com. Read Jews and the Sabbath, The Forgotten Cover-Up. Again, read Jews and the Sabbath, The Forgotten Cover-Up on worldslastchance.com. All right, I think scripture makes it clear. Passover is always on the 14th of Abib, the first month. Yeah. The Israelites were to stay in their homes until morning, but then they, what, just sat around and waited until nightfall. What was going on during those hours? They were keeping the Sabbath holy, but right. more than that, the Egyptians were coming to them, giving them gifts and urging them to get out. Now, you've still got your Bible open there, Miles. Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. Exodus chapter 12 and just read for us, if you would, verses 30 to 36. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Rise up, and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. And go, serve Yahuwah, as ye have said. Now, I'm going to interrupt right there. Sure, right. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night. But after this incredible display of divine power, after having explicitly told the people to stay inside until morning, do you really think that Moses and Aaron would have disobeyed Yah's command just to obey Pharaoh? Of course not. Of course not. No, obviously he wouldn't have done. Okay, keep reading. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said... We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians." So they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. The fact that the Israelites did not leave the night of Passover is clear from this verse. The next morning, they're still there. This yeah. is why the Egyptians were, quote, urgent upon the people. The Egyptians are going, what are you still doing here? Go on, get, get out, please. Look, look, here, just take this gold, take these jewels, just, just get out. But, but they didn't until at night. Right. So what you're saying is that the sacred hours of the Sabbath do not encompass a complete 24-hour period? That is correct. Now, right. I know this is a complete paradigm shift, but it's supported in Scripture. All right, but what about that verse that says, From evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath? That seems pretty conclusive. Don't you think? I'm glad that you asked that, and you're absolutely right. This is the verse that is used to support a sunset-to-sunset -sunset Sabbath observance. Yeah. The problem is it's a prime example of what happens when you base a belief on a verse that's taken out of context. Turn to Leviticus chapter 23, and let's see what that verse says when it's read in context. Okay, what, uh, Leviticus, I've got Leviticus 23. What verse? Let's read all of verses 26 through to 32. Okay. Leviticus 23 is the chapter that lists all of Yahweh's feasts. The very first feast listed is the weekly seventh-day Sabbath. And from there, it goes on and gives the dates of the yearly feasts and how they are to be celebrated. Right. This is the context of that statement you quoted. All right, go ahead and read, starting at verse 26. Now, it is a little long, but it's important right. to get the context. 
And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. And ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before Yahuwah your Elohah. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute for ever throughout your generations, in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month, at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. So, in context, what's it talking about here, specifically? Well, how to observe the Day of Atonement. Right. Nothing is mentioned here about the weekly Sabbath. We're talking only about the Day of Atonement, one of the yearly feasts. It is to be a 24-hour observation, and it is supposed to start the evening before. Now, here again, we have proof that a day starts with the dawning of light. It does not start at evening. But how do you get that from this? Well, let's just take a look at verse 32 again. It gives us the date on which we are to begin our observance of the Day of Atonement. And what does it say? Uh, it, it says... In the ninth day of the month, at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. There is no question that the Day of Atonement is always observed on the tenth day of the seventh month. That is the date for this annual feast. Right. Now, if Yahweh considered that the day started at sunset anyway, why did he mention the ninth of the month? If at evening a new day begins, it would not still be the ninth, it would already be the tenth. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. If the day really began at even, then the evening of any given date is when the date begins, not ends. So if the day began at even, he would have said, in the tenth day of the month at even, from even to even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. But he didn't. Instead, he said, in the ninth day of the month at even. So obviously, the evening of the ninth was still considered part of the ninth, not the tenth. Precisely, yes, you've got it. Right, OK. It's a mind-bender, I must say, Dave, it really is. And I've got to say, starting a day at night time has always seemed a bit weird to me. It's counterintuitive, I've said it time and time again, to say the day is beginning just as it's actually ending. And I've got a question for you, though. Mm. You kind of touched on it before, but let's talk about this. We know that a day begins with the dawn. We also know from Numbers 33, uh, verse 3, the date of the Israelites left Egypt, the 15th. On the biblical calendar, the 15th is always a weekly Sabbath. We also know from Deuteronomy 15, verse 1, that the Israelites left Egypt by night. Now, this is a bit troublesome because we know that Yahuwah never breaks his own laws, yeah? Yeah. And yet I can't see him having the Israelites carry all their belongings, driving all their flocks and herds with them on the Sabbath. I, I mean, moving is hard work, Dave. <laughs> yes, you're right. And Yah wouldn't do that. Not at all. Some people try to say that if Yah commands it, then it's all right. As the lawgiver, he can break his own laws. But that's just not how Yahweh operates. He is the lawgiver. As such, he never breaks his own laws. So again, you're right, there has to be some other explanation for why he would lead them out on the 15th, which we know on the lunisolar calendar is always a Sabbath. Well, the answer is amazingly simple, and it's also a brand new paradigm, and that is the sacred hours of the Sabbath are the daylight hours only. So you're saying there's no 24-hour Sabbath? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, so the Israelites left Egypt on the 15th, the night following the day of the 15th, but the Sabbath hours were over. I know it sounds crazy, I know. It's opposite to everything we've ever been taught, and it's certainly not what the Jews do today. However, it's true, and I can prove it from Scripture. Oh, all right, let's go for this. 
I want to hear this. I really okay. do. Well, let's start with the fourth commandment. Read, or of course, if you've got it memorised, just say it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Just that verse. Okay. Not the rest of the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <laughs> I really like my King James version of the Bible. Anytime it supplies a word, it puts it in italic so you can know that it's been added. And when you look up Exodus 20, verse 8, there are no supplied words. Every word translated into English is there in the original Hebrew. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We read this and we simply assume that it's talking about a complete 24-hour period here. But that's not what it's saying. We are to remember the Sabbath day to keep holy. So why have we made such assumptions? Well, let's take a look at John chapter 11 and read verses 9 and 10. Yahushua answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Are there not twelve hours in the day? Hmm, interesting question, wouldn't you say? And notice no one argued with him. Here is someone who every single word he says is always wrangled over and argued about, and yet when he says there are only twelve hours in a day, no one argues with him. To the Israelites, a day was the daylight hours only. Night was when it got dark. Now, here's another question for you. If a day starts at sunset, when it starts to get dark, when does a night begin? <sighs> That's a very good question, Dave. You're always full of them. I don't know. Well, they can't both start at the same time, can they? Or they would be the same. True. The Israelites weren't idiots. They had the words for day and for night, and they used them when appropriate. Just read Psalm 104, verses 19 and 20. Okay, one second. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness, and it is night wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. According to these verses, night begins when it starts to get dark. Now, let's see what the Bible says for when a day begins. Read Judges chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither, and they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. There's your definition. In the morning, when it is day. We've got to take Scripture just as it reads. We have to stop reading into Scripture what isn't there. Do this, it plays right into Satan's hands. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Millions of Christians today believe that the redeemed have eternal security. In other words, they suppose that once someone has been saved, he or she will always be saved. This may sound good, but a careful study of this belief reveals that it actually contradicts Scripture. If you would like to learn more, go to our website, worldslastchance.com, and read the article, Once Saved, Always Saved? Visit us today at worldslastchance.com and learn what Scripture teaches about the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Many adults wish they had had the opportunity in university to study religion. It's not too late. On worldslastchance.com, we have hundreds of articles and videos on many different religious and spiritual topics, with more being added all the time. There are articles that give advice on how to enjoy victorious Christian living. Other articles delve deeply into misunderstood passages of Scripture and explain what the original Hebrew meant. 
we also offer many articles and videos on prophecy. Paul told Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. If you will carefully read through the material on our website, you will have a thorough grounding in not only doctrinal truths, but you will also learn the secrets to effective prayer and how to study the Bible, so you can discover truth for yourself. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. It's never too late to get started. worldslastchance.com Preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Today's Daily Mailbag question comes from Ana Maria Cardoso in Fortaleza, Brazil. Okay, I think I've said that right. She says, Dear Dave and Miles, what is the best way to approach unsaved family members with the gospel? Do you have any suggestions on how to find common ground with an unbelieving relative? Hmm. Well, mm. yes, that can be tricky. Often, the ones nearest and dearest are their most difficult to reach. The reason is because out of anyone in the world, they can discern if our beliefs have really changed us or whether mm. it's uh, just a facade of righteousness. Yeah, that's the truth. And the word gospel, as any Christian knows, means good news. And that's exactly what it is. It is good news. Good news, yeah. But when we have good news, what do we want to do with it? We want to share it, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. We can't help it because it just flows out like a tap. And I've heard Christians talk about how difficult it is to witness and they just don't know what to say. Now, I would like to suggest that if you find yourself in that position, you need to worry less about witnessing for the moment and worry more about spending more time on your knees and in the word of Yah. When you know the gospel so well, when you're so full of the joy of Yahweh that you just can't contain it, uh, it will, as you say, just flow out of you you won't need to create artificial opportunities to share. Yeah, and I just want to insert as well, obviously any attempt to share or witness should always begin with prayer. Mm. And it doesn't mean you have to interrupt your conversation and say, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. But it does mean that uh, morning during your personal devotion time, you've already prayed and asked for an opening as well as the words to say. And don't forget, of course, that praying that the other person will have a heart softened to receive the words that we're given. You're right, prayer is of the most importance. Otherwise, we'll simply be depending on our own efforts and wisdom. With that said, I think it's important to point out that ultimately, we're just the mouthpiece for Yah, his spokesman, if you will. It's not our job to convince someone. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's our job simply to be filled with the spirit of Yah so that as he brings us opportunities, we can follow his guidance in when and what to say. Is there any particular thing you can say that would open up a conversation about the person's salvation? No, no, there isn't. Because each person, each individual situation is so different. And even if in my own wisdom I came up with a line, I wouldn't want to proffer it as the best way to introduce friends and family to the Saviour. That would be doing the work of the Holy Spirit for Yah. Yahweh will give you the words to say to reach the individual. Remember, each one of us has baggage. Each one of us has a mind that requires a unique approach, and Yah knows what approach is best to take with which person. We can leave that up to him. However, you can guide a conversation onto spiritual matters. And how? Just ask questions, like, for example, what do you think of this crazy weather we've been having recently? Have you ever known it to be so extreme? The increasing number of tragedies, both nationally and internationally, provide lots of opportunities for people to start thinking about their own mortality, and you can use that as a springboard into deeper conversations. And what about any Bible verses that you could suggest for using when witnessing? Uh, something that encapsulates the gospel message the best. Well, my personal favourite is John mm -hmm. chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. It's well known, mm -hmm. and it summarises the gospel clearly and beautifully. For Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you already have it memorised. Most Christians <laughs> yeah. do. But actually, Miles, that's just verse 16. Verse 17 is just as powerful, especially if the person with whom you are sharing has any fear of the Father. 
It goes, For Yah sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Another passage is found in Romans chapter 10. So could you just turn there for us and read verses 9 to 13 of Romans 10? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Yahushua, and shalt believe in thine heart that Yahuwah hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Elohah over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahuwah shall be saved. We have to keep a balance. On the one hand, no one is going to regret putting themselves out there to share the gospel. Someone once risked rejection to share truth with us, so now we too have an obligation to share with others. At the same time, we don't want to ever cram religion down someone's throat. There's no quicker way to ensure that they'll start avoiding you than to bring up their salvation every time you see them. The most important way we can witness is simply to live out the principles of love that Yahushua demonstrated. This means that when a family member stumbles into sin or any other difficulty, we can reach out in love to help. We don't use it as an opportunity to preach to them, wrapping our roads of pharisaical pride around ourselves. It means that in every encounter we have with the other person, they don't see us. They don't see me. They don't see you. Instead, all they see is Yahushua, because he is living in us, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to witness to anyone, family member, friend, or stranger. Ellis, we're out of time today, but keep sending us your questions and comments. Go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. We always look forward to receiving your messages. This is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. Of the multitudes of adults that left Egypt, only two, Caleb and Joshua, lived to enter the Promised Land. After a lifetime of faithfulness and service, Joshua called the elders, judges, and leaders of Israel and told them, quote, I'm old, advanced in age. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which Yahweh your Eloah spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. It's a beautiful homily. You can read all of it in Joshua chapter 23. What Joshua was wanting to emphasize before he died was the immense blessings that accompany wholehearted devotion and service to Yahweh. E. M. Bounds, in his classic book, The Power of Prayer, wrote, Men are Yah's method. The church is looking for better methods. Yah is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit doesn't flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men, men of prayer, unquote. The requirements to serve Yahweh are simple and straightforward. 
Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 lays it out. And now, Israel, what doth Yahweh thy Eloah require of thee? But to fear Yahweh thy Eloah, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve Yahweh thy Eloah with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Heaven pours out its richest blessings upon all who do this. Second Chronicles chapter 7 contains an incredible promise for all who will make the service of Yah foremost in their lives. Verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. What an overflowing abundance of blessing! He'll hear our prayers, He'll forgive our sin, and He will heal our land. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. You know, each time I learn something new and startling, I think, surely, this has got to be it, you know? And what more can the devil twist and corrupt and change? And yet, every single time, there's always something new, something different, you know? Who would have thought that even the understanding of when a day begins would be changed? The devil corrupts truth any way he possibly can. Yeah, but why? What's the point, Dave? Hiding when a day begins has had the effect of stealing the blessing of Sabbath observance. Instead of the Sabbath being a joy, it ends up being, well, let's be honest here, a burden. Mm, yeah, it really does. But not only that, it also creates an atmosphere of, I don't know how to put this, um, pharisaical standards. How many people who think the Sabbath is from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday have worked like mad to get something done right up to the instant the sun slips below the horizon? Yep, I know I have. <laughs> Me too. And how many of us have waited until the sun dropped below the horizon Saturday evening just so we could relax and have some fun? Mm. This is what I'm talking about when I say that the sundown to sundown Sabbath has created an environment in which Pharisaism has, has thrived. It reminds me of Yahushua's words in Matthew 23, verse 4, where he said, The Pharisees, quote, bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. Satan has really stolen the blessing Yah has always intended the Sabbath to be. Because you're right, when it's a burden, when you're stressed out trying to have everything perfect by sunset, you end up feeling like an exhausted athlete dragging yourself across the finish line. You're not welcoming the Sabbath as a blessing, not when it becomes a works-orientated burden. Mm, and then that's when you're waiting eagerly for the Sabbath to be over rather than welcoming its coming and, and, and being sorry to see it end. And this is why Satan has gone to the trouble to hide the truth of when a day begins. By making Sabbath observance a burden, people fail to gain the blessing Yahweh intended. And this is really crucial. We are very near the end. We're just now waiting for the sixth seal to open. When this happens, the whole world will know that something's up. Something is different. Then, when the trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9 begin to sound, we're going to need a faith in Yah's promises, a confidence in him that most of us, I'm, I'm speaking for myself here as well, simply don't have. Now, you've still got your Bible open there, Miles. Yep. Turn to Isaiah chapter 58, would you please? Yahweh has special blessings just waiting for those who will honour him and keep his Sabbaths. And it is these blessings, these spiritual gifts, we're going to need in order to make it through the days ahead. So you've got Isaiah 58 there. Could you just start uh, reading at the first verse? Yeah. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression 
and the house of Jacob their sins. This message isn't for unbelievers. This message is to Yah's people. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness, and did not forsake the ordinance of their Eloah. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching Eloah. This is significant. These are people who delight in approaching Yahweh. They don't understand why they're not blessed. What does it say next? Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and exploit all your labours. What's up, they're asking. How come we've done all the right things and we still aren't blessed? Now, mm. notice what Yahweh says in response. Indeed you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day, to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, and an acceptable day to Yahweh? Basically, what he's saying here is, sure, you fasted, but you've done it as a chore and a burden. You've done it to earn my goodwill. Then he goes on to explain what he's really looking for. And what he's looking for is heart service, service prompted by love. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free? and that you break every yoke. A pharisaical, legalistic observance of the Sabbath is a burden. That's not what Yahweh is looking for. He's looking for a love relationship. And when we have that, we will see Yah in those around us. Then we will love them as we love ourselves. OK, go ahead and read from verse 7 now. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. When we lay aside legalistic Sabbath observance, when we worship Yah for no other reason than we love him and we want to honour him with our obedience, then the blessings start to flow. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahuwah shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and Yahuwah will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. Yahuwah will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. This is what the Father wants to do for his children. But in order to be given these blessings, we need to lay aside the errors of papal tradition and the assumptions we've all made. We have to restore Sabbath keeping back to what it was always intended to be. That's the work of this final generation, to restore true Sabbath keeping and by doing this honour Yah with our willing obedience. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. What he's talking about here is a restoration of true Sabbath keeping. Yes, by the calendar of the Bible. Yes, beginning at the right time. But more than that, a restoration of the true spirit of Sabbath keeping. And when we do that, we will finally have the true blessing of Yah on our Sabbath keeping. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Yahuwah honourable, and shall honour him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in Yahuwah, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, 
the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Jacob, the cheater, became Israel when he wrestled with the angel of Yahweh and received a blessing. That is what is being offered all who will embrace the spirit of true Sabbath observance. And let me tell you, this is important. When you can't buy or sell because you've refused to worship on Sunday, it's going to take divine strength to stay faithful. This is the heritage of Jacob, the persevering reliance on the word of Yah alone for deliverance. If we will humble ourselves, not doing our own pleasure, not going through the motions of what makes us feel like we are saved, but by simply trusting in the merits of the Saviour, if we will lay aside our own efforts at righteousness, then the blessings of the Sabbath will be ours. This is the spiritual preparation we need now in order to make it through the days ahead then. These are the blessings Yah is just waiting to pour out when we obey him and keep the Sabbath simply and without embellishment. Just him and us. None of the traditions and errors that have turned the Sabbath into a burden. I'm so excited about this. These are very real blessings. These are the blessings Satan has stolen from us. First, he brings us a counterfeit calendar. Then he brings in a false day of worship. And for those who still have some glimmer of knowledge, some understanding of the Sabbath, however imperfect, he brings in an incorrect understanding of when the Sabbath begins. But <laughs> with the truth restored, wow, only the depths of divine love will reveal the richness of the blessings that await every one who surrenders all to Yahweh and worships him on his holy Sabbath. Join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahweh loves you and he is safe to trust. World's Last Chance is dedicated to preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Our shortwave radio programmes broadcast daily in seven different languages around the world, with more languages to come. Our videos and articles have been translated into over 30 different languages. And we're not just focused on any one point of doctrine. We want to partner with Heaven in bringing all truth to the world. Our articles and videos cover a variety of topics important to the growth and development of the Christian walk. We present material covering, practical piety in daily living, biblical beliefs grounded upon the word of Yah alone, the Creator's calendar, and end-time prophecies vital for you to know. We even cover various incorrect winds of doctrine Satan has used to deceive many and demonstrate from Scripture why it is wrong and what is the truth. Visit us today at worldslastchance.com. Learn the truth for these last days.
You have been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. <laughs>